Johannes, great to see you again. Great to spend a week together here in La Jolla, California. Um, and there's a car coming. <laughs> Despite all its powers, I think the car would win at the end. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, but it, it's been really great to, to, to kind of see you again mm -hmm. and, and to hear you play. And today you played the CPE Bach concerto that was just incredible. I mean, you played so beautifully and, and so just wonderfully. And, and also with such an incredible sound. And part mm -hmm. of that is this, this incredible instrument that you're holding. Right. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this instrument? So this is uh, Andrea Guarneri from 1694. Uh, which Andrea Guarneri built uh, two years before his passing. And uh, Andrea Guarneri was kind of known to be the budget Guarneri. So he, he never used the, the most expensive wood. He never, he never uh, took as much care as then later on his, his uh, nephews did. Yeah, but and um, he was in Cremona, right? He was, he was in Cremona. Which, so that was unusual for Cremona to use budget wood, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, I think because down the street, Mr. Stolivarius, uh, you know, used uh, used amazing stuff. Yeah, I haven't um, heard of him. Who is that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, interestingly, uh, so many Stradivarius instruments um, sound kind of damp when you use steel string um, because they just cannot handle the pressure. And this instrument, which is fairly small, um, actually can handle quite a bit of pressure. So I'm, I'm using modern strings, of course, on, on this instrument. And um, when I got it, uh, well, I didn't get it, of course, it, it, it belongs to a collector, but when the collector gave it to me um, about 12 years ago, it was um, in not the best shape. And so we had to give it to a violin maker who then completely overhauled it. Um, he changed the pegs, which were still metal pegs from the 1960s. So there was a lot of weight in the scroll. And um, I think a lot of sound was actually absorbed by, by the weight of, of, of these of Those these pegs. pegs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. And uh, so then in, during the restoration, um, the violin maker made the pegs smaller, uh, the, the peg holes smaller, just to fit normal pegs. You can see here that um, I'm only using three pegs. So um, the C peg is, is off for better posture. So, so you can get your head in the can, right place. I can, I can yeah, can I, I actually don't have to walk around like a camel, uh, which, which is the typical, oh, he's a is a typical cello <laughs> disease. Uh, but you can actually, if, right. if, you, re if you remember that we can, one can actually um, stand straight, yeah. um, then that is very helpful. And um, So w was this being played by a cellist sort of immediately before it was acquired for, for you to use it? Or? So um, this is actually a quite a almost like a tragic story because the um, the person that owns it, he is an uh, amateur cellist, actually very gifted amateur cellist. And, and he was, he, was uh, he got this instrument in the 1960s as a present from his father. And the father said, yes, you can, you can own this cello, but you, you have to study medicine. Yeah. Like you, you cannot become a cellist. Yeah. And so, um, this instrument means a lot to the collector and uh, that's why I think it's such a gift that I get to play this instrument because it's such a personal instrument uh, for him. Yeah. Um, and before that... You're giving it a new voice. Absolutely. Bringing it to life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was interesting because the, the owner that had it before, um, he sold the instrument uh, to, to this family of doctors um, in order to emigrate to America. And when I did a recording of the Chopin sonatas, uh, his, I think his granddaughter came to uh, where I was recording in Stuttgart and actually listened to the instrument that enabled the family to emigrate, you know, about oh, wow. uh, uh, 60 years before. And uh, it was amazing to see because it, um, this instrument for them meant uh, that they could start out in a completely new life. Yeah. And, and so, um, this is more than just you know a piece of wood that, that makes music, but actually it, it, it's a symbol for for yeah for, for a new beginning. Yeah. Um, wow, that's beautiful. And, and yeah, absolutely. And, and we can trace it back to about 150 years ago when Julius Klengel, uh, who was a famous pedagogue but also um, cellist in his own right, um, played this instrument, not as his main instrument, but um, but as a secondary instrument. And to pay homage to that. Um, and I can send you that video. Uh, I recorded the hymnals from Julius Klengel for 12 cellos, but all by myself. 
Oh wow! So I, I used okay. um, uh, like video um, over like overlap um, to uh, yeah to to record that piece, and uh, that was kind of my my tribute to this to this wonderful wonderful piece. Um, when you look in the back, and I wonder if we we should uh, bring that bring that maybe a bit closer, but it has two procession holes here. Oh, for carrying it with a strap. Exactly. Ah. Yeah, there was a strap with a hook, and you could hook the the instrument into the um, into that strap, into that hook, and then, then walk processions. And you see that they're kind of ripped in, so someone might have like stepped into like a little hole and, and actually ripped the holes a little bit bigger. Oh, wow. So that's at least what some people th think that these holes are not really were not really meant for processions, but at least that's that's how they're called. They're called processional holes. So yeah. we don't we don't necessarily know. There's only a very short period of time when these were actually uh, used in instruments. And it could very well be that these were added later on, yeah. uh, so not not at the time when the instrument was. Now was I'm, actually built. I'm seeing that it looks like it's been expanded. Is that right? Um, yes, it's been it's been um, made smaller, so to a probably to a um, three quarter cello, as you can see here. So it's been cut down. Yeah. And then it was made bigger again. Wow. So it's been through a lot. It's, it's a like like a viola story. It's <laughs> that happens to violas a, a lot. It's a real, it's a real Frankenstein. This one, so <laughs> yeah. But you know, sometimes that's what makes it sound so great. Well, I would say that, that what it definitely does is it gives personality. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I I have a wonderful modern instrument, and and it's it has great projection. What is that instrument? Um, that is actually from the person that uh, restored this instrument, Ragnar Hein. He's a Berlin maker. Okay. And. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's a wonderful instrument, but of course, uh, the patina of um, 320 years, you can't just magically uh, build that into a new instrument, right? right? So, uh, I mean, every instrument started at year zero at some point, and so for me, what is exciting about the new instrument is that I get to um, break it, break it, and, and <laughs> also and also steer steer the sound for this instrument and for for the beginning of it. Yeah. Right? Um, You're gonna put some processional holes in. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just might out of frustration. <laughs> <laughs> so, how would you describe the sound of this instrument then? Because if you're talking about the, the patina, and yeah. So this instrument is fairly small, um, and therefore it doesn't have these sort of very extremely uh, naturally deep qualities that you would get in a Montagnana, for example, um, or in or in a guanary that actually is is not as flat as this one, but would have more of a of a, of a belly. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say the projection is rather uh, forceful, and um, I I like to compare it to like a Bach trumpet. You know, you don't you don't get the re resonance, but with the small trumpets, but but yeah. but but you get a lot of punch out of it. Um, I find it I find it extremely uh, nice to maneuver because because this part uh, is is not so wide so I, I get sure. to maneuver very very easily around um, and to, to reach around the fingerboard to reach around the yeah. fingerboard exactly because because this is this is always a bit of a this uh, troublesome uh, area like when we hit the fourth position and we need to actually go over it right when cellos were designed you didn't have to go that high exactly yeah. in fact um, ma and we talked about this uh, I think in a lot of cellos at the time were five string instruments. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they would have an added E string. Um, and so this, is, this was definitely d designed for four strings, but you see some older scrolls that actually had five pegs. Right. And um, hence, like, box six cello suite. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it was, um, at the time, it was still undecided if a cello would have four strings or, or five strings. Uh, as a side note, the, one of the most exciting things is to go to uh, musical instrument museums for me. Yeah. Um, because you see that what we perceive as sort of an, a normative cello or a normative horn or a normative trumpet, um, back in the day those were all prototypes and they, 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 there was no um, no measurement that was that was sort of regarded as, as a universal norm. and. Uh, that's what I find so so interesting about the older instruments, um, which you know came in all sort of weird forms and shapes and, and, and sizes, and then around the time of Viom were, were cut down 
right. uh, to to a certain to fit a certain model and certain expectation. And uh, but when you go to, to to these musical instrument museums, you see the instruments in their original form and. It could have been that this was meant as a as a smaller instrument to begin with. A viola. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or or even even okay. like a like a like a spalla, like, like a spalla. Like on the shoulder. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's a little big for that because people right. were also smaller then. Um, but a two-person spalla. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, precisely. Um, and do, do you have it indefinitely? Well, I mean, I you know I, I have very good, um, very positive contact. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, a very nice friendship with with the owner of the yeah. instrument. So so I I enjoy that contact very much. Yeah. Uh, because obviously this is not just you know a sort of neutral contact like with a bank or something like that, but it's right. actually a person that cares a lot about this instrument and also cares about me. And and I'm very happy to to then uh, you know share. Um, things from the tour and, and, and share share impressions, invite to the concerts that I give and all that. And, and this cello is, after so many years, is part of your voice now. Like your imprint is in this instrument and it's in I you. I think so. I think so. I mean, it, it has changed a lot. Um, and I've, of course, I've experimented a lot with strings and I've experimented a lot with different bridges and all that. And it's an, it's an ongoing thing. But um, what I like about it is that it is not an easy instrument. Like it is not, is, it doesn't have a natural ease. There is, for example, a wolf on the G string. Uh, sometimes that that wolf moves to an F sharp. Sometimes to an F. So, so depending on the climate where I am, it's 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 very temperamental in that sense. Yeah. But what I like about that is that um, it really is a very living, a very alive organism that that you're dealing with, and it's not something stale or abstract, but it's yeah. something that keeps constantly evolving, and I, I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. yeah. Can we hear you play a little bit of sure, it? Sure, absolutely, yeah. We'll, we'll test the outdoor acoustics. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 